This is a pre-intro to the actual episode. Folks, I want to share with you, especially for my regular listeners, we are at one point going to get technical on Facebook ads, especially in the beginning. See, Nikki and I, we run a Facebook ads agency together and we kind of nerd out in the beginning. So if you're like listening and you are really into Facebook ads, you're going to find that super, super, super helpful. If you're like, mm, Facebook ads aren't quite yet my jam, Tom, don't worry. Just stick through it with us and we get into some really awesome stuff that whether you're an activist, thought leader, creative, you're running a brick and mortar business, whatever it is that you are doing, if you are dealing with customers, you're going to find what we share super, super helpful. So stick around for the whole conversation and we look forward to your thoughts. And this is the end of the pre-intro. Let's run the regular intro. Here we go. Greetings. I am Tom Murrow. On this week's episode, we talk what is working in marketing, intentional relationship building with Nikki Rautenberg. Check it out. Greetings. I am Tom Murrow. And this is my year of depth. We know you could be anywhere. So the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment, you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. As you can see, I am not alone. We have a return amazing guest. She goes by the name of Nikki Rautenberg. What's going on, Nikki? Not too much. Excited to chat today. Same here. So for those of y'all who don't know, Nikki is super awesome. I get to work with her every day here at the celebration. And uh, we work together on running people's ads and in our program, the Retargeting Runway Implementation Group. She also represents famous hockey players and does all of their, this is where I run out of ways to describe it. Take it from here. <laughs> Yes. So basically I facilitate their partnership, their paid partnerships for social media is the, the main way to look at that. There we go. Like as an agent, right? Yeah. Boom. That's what's up. So that's Nikki. Y'all. If you haven't checked out past episodes, it'll be in the show notes where we had you on here. I feel like two or three times. So yeah, I think, I think three, this is probably third. Third. There we go. So usually, so Nikki and I meet, you know, once a week, in addition to serving our clients. And I've always noticed like the first half hour is just us kind of just venting slash brainstorming slash sharing more or less what we're seeing work really well right now in marketing, both things that are need to stop happening, things that need should happen more of. And I thought it'd be fun for y'all to have kind of a bird's eye view, fly on the wall, insert another way animal see <laughs> giraffe looking over something. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any other animal analogies that we, you think we can throw into the mix here? Um, no, I don't know. I, I think of like bird or eagle eye, but that's the same eagle thing. Eagle eye, it's just another, just another bird. So the way dolphins can see with their clicks, you know, um, the way dogs can smell. Basically that, but you get access to the conversations we have, like dolphins clicking. So that, <laughs> as you can tell, this is going to be very serious. It's a very serious conversation. So where do you, where do you want to start? What have you seen working? What's annoying you that should stop? What are just, just some general, just let's do it. Let's just jump in. What do you got for us? Um, I think we should start with iOS. And basically what it was initially like when iOS started to get ruled out, iOS 14, that is, um, and what it kind of turned into in recent weeks with further implementation of that by users. Um, so for those that are unfamiliar, uh, the iPhone software has been updated to iOS 14 or is available to be updated to iOS 14. And if you've seen the commercials or seen the hoopla online about it, um, essentially it gives a very clear opportunity for users to opt out of website tracking 
user behavior uh, on your phone, which because of that has really impacted the type of data and the amount of data that social media apps, most specifically um, Facebook and Google, which includes Instagram since Instagram is connected with Facebook, um, are able to track and in terms of your user behavior on the web, uh, your buying behavior and all of those things. So a few weeks ago or a few months ago, this has been in the works for over a year. I would say it's been in the news for probably a year and a half, if not longer. Um, a few weeks ago is when it really started to get pushed out onto iPhones and users began updating their software. And when, if you are an iPhone user, you know that you've been likely getting the pop-up when you've been visiting um, your app that have prompted you to either allow tracking or it'll say something like, uh, don't allow the app to track. And so because of this, for people that are running ads like us, this has created an impact on how we are able to target, how we are able to retarget, um, and perhaps most uh, importantly in terms of the impact is how we're able to track um, what is happening as far as attribution. So attribution is when somebody takes an action online, um, whatever that conversion action is that you're aiming for. So sometimes that could be somebody opting in as a lead. Sometimes that could be somebody purchasing something. Um, sometimes that could be somebody visiting a certain page. Um, it's really skewed attribution. And for ad buyers like ourselves to be able to track exactly where those conversions are coming from. So in, in my experience, that's been the, the biggest impact is the attribution element. Um, because at the same time, uh, it forced Facebook and Instagram to change their attribution window from 28 days to seven days, which means that if a user previously, if a user took an action on your ad and then did the, or sorry, saw your ad or engaged with your ad and then took the action that you desired them to take within 28 days, that action would still get attributed to that ad. But now that 28 day window has shut down to seven days, um, which makes it a lot shorter, which makes it very difficult for us to understand um, how our audience is benefiting us long term. So it was a very long winded way of saying that uh, when it was first released, I think understanding exactly the impact was going to be difficult until we could actually see it. And now that we can actually see it, that is the biggest thing that I noticed. The attribution is very skewed and it's going to take a long time to learn how to deal with that, um, as well as figuring out audiences and more importantly, retargeting, which is a big part of our business. So... Loving that. Now, what I hear though, this is something you and I joke about. We actually created a meme and ran it as an ad. Uh, and the meme is like somebody's on a bicycle and they have like a stick in their hand. Let me describe this for, let me paint y'all a meme picture. So somebody's on their bicycle and they have a stick in their hand and it's like, wants to make money with Facebook ads. And then the next one is like, runs ad with bad copywriting and then you see them sticking the stick into their their wheels so that they make themselves trip and then afterwards they're like oh darn i curse you ios yeah so in, in other words like it seems that people are blaming anything that goes wrong in their marketing on the apple ios updates what are what are your do you find this to be justified I think it's only justified for people that had a system up and running that was clearly very functional prior to iOS. So if you had a campaign, if you had campaigns or funnels that were running that were like without a doubt successful, bringing you ROI, um, had very clear tracking and very clear attribution and data all through every part of the funnel, if you had those things um, prior to iOS, and now you're seeing massive changes. So specifically, um, if you are one of those people, one of the areas that we've seen have massive change is in the CPM. So that is the cost to get in front of a thousand people on these uh, through ads. Um, so we've actually seen for people that have really well-oiled funnels or well well-oiled machines in the back end, we have seen. CPM be and attribution, but CPM be impacted. Um, that is mainly because with more people blocking the uh, app tracking, it's really 
creating smaller audiences for Facebook to be able to serve ads to, which has increased competition in these auctions. So because of all those factors, it's going to organic, not organically because it's paid, but it's going to, that is the impact that it will have. There's more people competing for a smaller audience. Therefore, that number is going to increase. So if you are somebody with a well-oiled machine, um, it is fair to blame things on iOS. However, exactly to your point is that for people that didn't have a well oil machine, they are not taking accountability and responsibility for that. And they are blaming a lot of things on iOS um, without really, you know, going back to the drawing board and looking at the different elements of their funnel, including their copy or, or their ad copy or, or what they have going on for their funnel and figuring out where the disconnect may be along the way there. So I like this. So in other words, if you had something that was doing really well, an ad campaign that was doing really well, and it's it's recently stopped working really well, and the only thing that's changed is the Apple iOS update, then yes, it is most likely the Apple iOS update. However, if you're just starting to run ads, if you were running ads not as successful, it is most likely not the Apple iOS update that's impacting. Now, that's not to say that the Apple iOS update isn't affecting you, but it's not like the biggest thing that's affecting you because Apple iOS update is affecting everybody across the board. And yet there's yeah. still people who are winning at Facebook ads. So it's always helpful in life. This is a good business. I always think is one of the most spiritual things you can do is such a good philosophy that we should focus on what we can control. We can't control Apple iOS update. So don't spend your time in like, Oh, that's, that's, this is why it sucks. It's out of my hands. So we should, you should come back to your creative, your messaging, your copy, all of those things. What have you been seeing works well with those things we can control? Connecting with an audience, putting out ads that actually connect. Huge question, I know. So if there's anything that you see in general that's working or in specific, what, what are you seeing, Nikki, that's, that's working well right now? Well, I think if we're acknowledging the the good and the bad of this um, and taking into account the changes that it is making across the board. If we're acknowledging that CPM is higher, we need to look at strategies that allow for us to decrease that. And we already know from before iOS that the best way to decrease your CPM is to run a campaign for impressions or for reach and engagement versus running it for conversions or traffic. So in acknowledging that, to answer your question around what is working um, or what are some of the things that are going well, building or that will help you do better, um, focusing on that audience building element is really going to be a massive key component for people that want to quote unquote win at ads. Um, the other thing is, even though we have always looked at the top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, we really understand that process. There are a lot of people that run ads that don't understand the difference between um, the stages of the funnel, as well as understand where your audience might be um, in terms of your, your Facebook audience or your Instagram audience might be while they're engaging with you on the platform and whether they're a cold audience, warm audience or hot audience. Um, and so for people that are, are trying to get into Facebook right now or trying to do better with their ads, um, really having a strong understanding and having ads running for each of those stages of the top of the funnel, top, middle, and bottom um, is going to be really, really important. I co-sign that. And just for, for those of you who maybe aren't as familiar, it's always helpful for us to re-familiarize top of funnel, we define as people who have never heard of you. Completely cold. I don't know who this person is. Middle of funnel, that's where retargeting begins. They have heard of you. Now there's different temperatures of have heard of you. They've heard of you because they've watched 25 seconds of one of your videos. They've heard of you because they've been following you for a long time. They've heard of you because they just went to your website. So some sort of action they've taken that has indicated you're not a complete stranger to them. And then bottom of funnel, the infamous, the one I feel like people put the most emphasis on, but is usually going to be the uh, 
the last thing you need to worry about for a lot of us out there, and that's usually some sort of, it's your hottest market. So it's usually somebody who has some purchase consideration, but hasn't followed through on that purchase consideration. So for example, they went to your checkout page, but they didn't check out. They got on a sales call, but didn't book. Those kind of things. If you've ever seen an ad where it's like, oh, you didn't finish checking out or you sure you don't want this thing? That would be, you would be in that person's bottom of funnel audience. So when Nikki was saying, the traffic building or audience building is a really big component of your ad that you have to focus on that. That would mean top of funnel that we need to make sure that we're warming ourselves up to new people, that we're introducing ourselves to new people through adding content, not by asking anything of them. So putting out videos that you know share, this is who I am. These are the problems I've solved. Building those relationships, doing that first and delaying the, let's get them as a lead. Let's get them on a sales call and waiting until you're in middle of funnel or waiting until they know who you are to then ask for something. And I'd say for me, that has been a big aha for me having you know us together and teaching together for the past six months and then running ads together for almost a year is um, people throw out the window things that we would normally do in real life. So if I was just meeting you, I'd be like, hi, I'm Tom. How are you? Good, good. Cool, cool, cool. And then I'd find an opening, right? Oh, well, this is what I do. And then if you're like, wow, that's boring. I'd be like, yeah, agreed. It's a terrible job. Wow, what's, what about this, right? But if they're like, that's so cool. I've actually been looking for somebody. So you naturally warm up the conversation. But what people do, especially when they start to do paid ads, it's like, no, I just want right away. The first time someone sees me, I want them to give me something. So it's like, hi, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. Don't you think it's interesting? If so, click below. And so what ends up happening is you are competing with a lot of people who are trying to do that. So it's expensive and not effective. So it's like two things that we don't like, expensive, not effective. I'm I'm seeing a lot of head nods. What this is resonating with you too? Well, yeah, I just agree. I agree with that totally. And that's, that's exactly what I was trying to say in regards to um, just being aware of where your audience are, where audience is and being conscious of what you are putting out as your content for each of those stages of the funnel. Um, because to your point, bottom or even, you know, the, the bottom half of the middle of funnel um, is where you would be starting to ask for something. And if we think about it in real life, you don't just walk up to a stranger and say, hi, buy my thing. And if you do, they reject you. So to actually pay to be doing that on a social platform, it just doesn't make sense. But it's what people do all of the time. Um, And furthermore, they are then disappointed with why it's not working. And then that's how we circle back to this whole like, darn you iOS when it's really like, no, it's your, your approach. (laughs) That's actually the problem. You have bad breath. That's what it is. (laughs) But don't worry y'all. There's a way out. That's why you're here. So hopefully this is adding some tools. There's something I hear all the time that I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on. I hear people say, you know, I'm, my main audience is on Instagram. I am on Instagram. I'm not even on Facebook. Therefore, I only want to run Instagram ads, not Facebook ads. What comes up for you when you hear that? Um, so I think that, that there is value in understanding where your audience is. I think if you have that awareness that your audience is on Instagram, that, that's awesome. Um, so one thing that I would say is that it is a little bit uh, naive, even if you do think that you know your your uh, avatar super well. Um, and even though Facebook is slowly becoming a thing of a past from a user standpoint, um, people still are on Facebook. So for you to think like that they're not on there and you don't want to target ads towards there, um, you are going to have a missed opportunity, especially given the increased competition with these changes. So I would still encourage people to at minimum test running ads specifically on Facebook. Um, Now, if you've ever heard me speak before or you've seen any of our trainings, you know that I always encourage to separate your Instagram campaigns from your Facebook ad campaign. So one of the issues is that people will just choose all the placements available. Uh, The problem with that is that we get very, very murky data. So if you want to know where your audience is actually responding to you, because it doesn't really matter where they actually are, 
it matters where they're engaging with you and where they're going to respond to you from an ads perspective. Fully understanding that organically, they probably engage with you more on, on Instagram, but you might have an opportunity on Facebook as well. So separate your um, campaigns, run to both different platforms and see where you're getting the biggest response. Um, I do think that if you are going to run Instagram ads, the other thing is that it's important to uh, make sure you're using the actual Facebook business ad manager platform and not using the promotion tools that are within the Instagram app itself. Um, and that is a huge mistake that a lot of people make because it's very easy when you see that button that says click this to promote people will just dive in and they'll start fiddling around with things in there and that's actually um, a huge waste of money so if you are going to if you do want to target people on instagram and engage with your audience on instagram from a paid perspective make sure that you're actually using business manager does that answer your question yeah no that nailed it I'd add add on to it. I think most people are approaching running ads from a organic social media perspective. So Mm -hmm. it's like, it makes sense if you've mainly been doing social media marketing that your audience is on Instagram because from a Facebook business page perspective, you're so limited in what you can do. You know what I mean? Like you can post, but you can't like a regular person's post as a, a business, you can't do DM strategies as a business. You have to do that from your personal Facebook. So it makes sense mm-hmm. that you've been spending these past years every day working to build your Instagram presence. And so then it's like, well, I don't want to worry about running Facebook ads because I'm not even doing anything on Facebook. But for the most part, people aren't going to, when they see your Facebook ad, go, okay, let me click on this person's profile and then go look at a whole bunch of their timeline stuff. And I think that's what people are saying is like, I haven't been consistent on Facebook. I don't want people to see that. And it's, it's reminds me of another conversation we had with one of our students this week where it was, I have all of this content. How do I get in front of it? How do I get it in front of everybody? And we are saying that with ads, we're, cutting out the amount of time people have to spend going through lots of our different content. So instead of kind of a content marketing strategy where it's like, hey, here's 50 free videos, watch them as you go and fall in love with me over the course of them. Yes, that works great. But what we're instead saying is, let me save you time. Here's really the condensed version of those 50 in the form of one of these videos or in the form of once you become a lead in the form of this training and then saying, you don't want to have to go through those 50 videos. You want my product service or offering that's going to save you time and help take you to the next level. So it's really creating like a curated experience and people usually don't tend to go outside of that curated experience. They don't tend to go, let me go look through all your stuff. It's more, they're like, that was really interesting. And then with retargeting, we get in front of them the next day that was really interesting. And then we get in front of them the next day until they're like, okay, let me take this to the next level. So I would say if you're the kind of person who's been spending all your time on social media, on Instagram, to not then say, well, I don't want to run Facebook ads because it should really be, our mindset should be, where can we get the cheapest traffic that is of the highest quality? And Facebook or Instagram are going to be your go-tos. And so we should just really let the data tell us which one it is. And you don't have to spend a ton of money to figure that out. It's not like $10,000 later. It's like $50, $100 later. So those are, those have kind of been my thoughts on that. Anything you want to add on that before I, I bring on the next thing? Yeah, I think the attitude of like, well, I'm not active on Facebook, so I don't want to run an ad. You really nailed it because very rarely do we actually click into that person's page. And then even if we did, we're not like, Oh my God, they haven't posted on here since 2018. Like that's just not user. That's not typical user behavior. So that type of excuse is really more coming from the creator than the actual end user that you're targeting. It's funny. I was listening to a podcast today and they were talking about, you know, you can have a practice, you can have something you're learning but you eventually want it to become a way of thinking. And social media marketing is a way of thinking. Paid ads is a way of thinking. And it can be challenging to think that they are the same way of thinking. 
And then each platform has its own way of thinking. Like right now we're learning to how to become as great at YouTube ads as we are at Facebook ads. And one of the thing our coaches keep saying is like when he was learning how to use YouTube ads, after he finished running Facebook ads for somebody, he would literally do something else for 15 minutes to reset his mind. And so with when you're thinking of it from a, this is what I've been doing, but you haven't been running any paid ads. It's all been organic social media stuff. There's got to be like a pause. Okay. There are things about this that are similar, but it's like playing a different sport. Like yes, soccer and I don't know, another sport, volleyball. Like they are both a sport, but you can't kick the ball in volleyball and you can't you know, like spike the ball in soccer or football. So there's, yeah, similar sports and you're outside, but they're, they're different worlds. And so that's kind of when uh, a lot of, I think what we do is just trying to get people to start to think like a paid marketer rather than organic. Boom. Yeah, I agree a hundred percent. That was a great example. <laughs> yeah, was it was. It? I'm not I'm being serious. That's okay. Great. Yeah, no. <laughs> was it as good as my giraffe and dolphins analogy? <laughs> to be honest, it was better. Okay. So, <laughs> I, be a dolphin in the water is not the same as a fly on the wall. Got it. Noted. <laughs> oh. Is there anything else on that that you think are some of the like I guess core principles or some things you're seeing of? hey, here's a really great way to turn this into a way of thinking in terms of here's how to think like somebody who's running paid ads. Um, I think that when we are in our business and to your point, like an organic plan and a paid plan, they they are different and they need to be. Um, And I think when we think about running paid media, a lot of times we think about selling. And so it's very easy for our, so when we're doing our organic strategy, we're basically like, here's something cool that I know. And then when we think about our paid strategy, we think about like, oh my gosh, I need to get the sale. And a lot of that does stem from the fact that you're putting money out there. So you want to bring money back in. And I would just encourage people to not have that line in the sand when it comes to paid because I think it, you'll find if you take a similar approach to your content with paid as you do with organic from like a, here's this cool thing, here's some value for you um, and not stress about the ROI, that ROI will actually come a lot easier because you're actually creating that connection. And so ra- when you're doing paid media, when you're doing ads, rather than thinking about them as like, this is an ad, I must sell and I'm putting money into it, so I must make money back, thinking about it still as like, what can I do to engage this audience? How can I create value? How do I make these people want to see more of my stuff? Um, Will get you so much further than just having that sales and, and ad strategy mindset. I love that. You know, the other thing I wanted to talk about was sort of what we've been talking about this week with our students is this, I feel like Facebook ads, the messaging, right? So the message we kind of receive from other marketers who have sold this dream that having online business means automation, making money in your sleep and kind of like almost a hands-off approach. Like, okay, I get it. I do a bunch of work where I record the ads, I record the webinar, I write the email sequences. But once all that upfront work is done, then it just kind of runs itself and people just magically become customers. I'm curious what your your thoughts, your rants, your dolphin in the water. I'm really trying to push this. Your dolphin in the water, giraffe over the wall perspective on this is. I mean, I think that you do a great job at, communicating this to people probably better than I do. And that's not to be self-deprecating, but I think that you are so good at it from a, not just a strategic perspective from and sales perspective, but just from a human perspective, this is one of your really great core strengths and why I appreciate working with you so much um, because you figured out a way to make relationship building the priority and what, 
you're able to do from that relationship building is pivot it into a sale. Um, but the whole process is very, very fluid um, and comes across as very authentic. But I think the thing that people are selling with the ads that you were referring to is that they're kind of glazing over the actual process elements of it. And so when, and I think I would love for you to speak to this rather, rather than me, but when you explain that process and the fact that it is a process and you remind us all that like this hyper automation that comes with having multi-million dollars of revenue um, a year and having a massive team or a larger team um, is, is definitely an end goal, but it's not realistic for the majority of us. And so instead we have to do these things. Um, I think you create a lot of clarity for people in the way that you explain it. So I don't know if you want to take a, a crack at that, but you, it is really focused on the relationship building side. I always come back to this, this thing that happened to me where, so I got for my birthday, I got a Solange album on vinyl and was just like so hyped because it completed the, now I have all of her albums on vinyl. So I was like, yes, this is awesome. So I went to play it and the album was amazing. So this is not a Solange commentary, but it sounded like shit because of my, the record player I had at the time. And it was like the final straw for me. And so I was like, I need to get a new record player. So I probably spent, I don't know, an unreasonable amount of time researching the right record player, spent tons of money on getting the best system, got it on the place. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of dollars later, got it in place, sounded amazing. Okay. Totally awesome. The mindset I had when I was buying that record player was like, not quite money is no object. You know, I wasn't going to spend $5,000, which you can do. But it was like, I definitely upped the threshold of like, whatever it takes to a limit, I'm going to make this happen. Okay. Then I was like, this sounds great. Let me celebrate. So then I went on DoorDash and was like, let me get my favorite food, Sully Vegan, and was about to check out. And I saw that these assholes were going to charge me $2 for a delivery fee. And that just broke me. I was like, you got to be kidding me. So I went on every other app until I found one that was willing to not make me pay that. I think I found like a coupon in this, but it took me like almost an hour to save $2 after having spent hundreds of dollars on this record player. And so it's like, we have to kind of understand that the buying process is one that is based in irrational behavior. Like that is completely irrational on my behalf. It's like such a good example, $2 I spent an hour to save $2 when, you know, if we were to be like, Tom, you could have made this much money if you would have just spent that hour. But it's like, no, it's like the principle of the matter, which is so irrational and egoic and all of those things. And yet that is what it is like what goes into all of our purchase behavior, everything that you buy, that kind of stuff goes into it. And so we've kind of created this myth in our mind that it's, easier to get money from people than we believe that like somehow people are going to go through this automated experience that has no really personal personalization and then come out the other end of it and give you a thousand dollars. And I also think, especially in the coaching industry, we've like, like warped in our mind price. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, it's like, it's just a thousand. And I get it. I'm not trying to say that people won't give you the thousand But to think that you don't have to have some element of personalization in that is crazy because it's either like I can go with one of the big box course creators that everybody's heard of or a huge thought leader. And I am going to sign up for them because of their name. They have the brand recognition and I want to be, I want to have close proximity to that name. Okay. That's one thing you cannot compete with that, but that person cannot compete with you on the ability you have to find a way to personally connect with each one of your people, to answer every single one of those questions. And I think online business owners are the worst at this because if somebody was to come into your restaurant, this is what you and I talked about this last week. Let's say they come into your restaurant and you know they're going to spend like what, like 50 bucks. Okay. And let's say they come in just by themselves. You make a decision. 
it is not worth my time having me or my staff go up to somebody who's eating by themselves. Be like, what can I get you? How are you? Like all the back and forth you'd have to do with someone that was going to eat in your restaurant. You're like, just one person, they're going to spend 25 bucks, not worth my time. I might just break even. So anybody who comes in by themselves, you're like, no, 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 come back when you have somebody or you just neglect them. You're like, okay, anybody who comes in by themselves, just leave a pitcher of water, like leave like four things they can choose to eat from and like give them like a little stripe card, like automate the process, right? Because it's not worth our time. We can, we can all hear how absurd that is. Like that person's going to talk shit about you to every single person. I would, anyone who would listen, I would talk shit about you. It's the same thing for your online business, for your coaching. If you don't do the personal touch and you and I are competitors, I will win only because I'm going to do a personal touch if we were the same on everything else. And so really, especially in the beginning, when you're trying to figure out what gets people to purchase, you're only going to figure that out through the one-on-one conversations. It's the only way. And I know people are like, oh, but that takes so much time. It's like, yes, welcome to business. <laughs> like, it's, Yes, I agree. People are not, like, especially in an industry where people are constantly marketed to. If it's the same kind of marketing, you're going to go in sub, like subconsciously into the same category. But you set yourself apart when you're like, oh, Nikki, hey, I know that you were on CNN last week. I saw it. That's awesome. What was it like being on CNN? You're like, oh, damn, you remember that. I remember I mentioned that to you and you remember that. That's cool. Now you set yourself apart. So also Nikki really was on CNN, weren't you? No, I was, I was, it was BBC. BBC! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what's interesting that you point out all the time too, in regards to this whole personalization process, or disconnect that's created by not by focusing on this goal of automation, um, especially in the course create in the course world, coaching world, that this whole industry is that what ends up happening when people start to go down this process of the of trying to automate is when people don't purchase, they convince themselves that it's because of the price, and they very quickly think oh, well, they didn't buy it for $9.97, um, so I need to drop it to $4.97. And then when someone doesn't buy it for $4.97, well, I need to drop it to $2.97. And to your point with your story about the record player and the food is that it actually has nothing to do with the price at all. It's 100% to do with the experience and with the process. And if you give somebody the right experience, if you, if even that solo person walking into the restaurant if you give them the right experience, they're tipping more, even on if their dinner costs less. So there's still so many opportunities to win in this process outside of lowering your lowering your price. Um, and I think that that is a mindset trap that a lot of people in this space happen to fall into as well, which is really unfortunate. Such a great point. I, in the analogy with the, the DoorDash, I've, I've shared that if, if Serena Williams ran DoorDash, if it was her company, I'd pay like an $80 delivery fee just because it'd be awesome for her to win in this space. So it's like, if you have the relationship, then it's such a good point. I, it's, it's, I was just reflecting last night with Adora how you know we keep raising the price for our retargeting runway and we're getting more people that are signing up than before. And it's because we are upping the personalization in the sales process even more each time. And so I think it's it's great to like right now for everybody, I think to just make a decision in your mind, you are not going to lower your price. Instead, you're going to increase the level of relationship building you're doing. And so it just, it comes down to details. Like we were sharing with our our folks in our group last, just this week, how if you show up to one of our live workshops, we are going to have somebody who's going to take notes on something you said so that afterwards I can be like, hey, I really appreciated how you said this thing. Now, the difference is that it's real. Like I genuinely do appreciate that you did that. It's not a gimmick. And so if you're like, okay, let me do this. Let me like pretend I care. Like people have so much choice right now. We are so inundated with performers and marketers 
people will tell. So, but I kind of feel like I don't have to say that because I think most people listening to this do care. So it's like, this is the, when someone is in a stage where they're like considering you, that's really where you want to model how much you care. You want to start to illustrate, hey, if you're in our program, if this is how much I'm showing you I care and you're not even in the program yet, just imagine how it's going to look. Hmm. And I think uh, I think what's really important about that too is continuing that level of value once you do have the sale. So for us, you know, we're constantly looking at ways to improve. We are taking feedback every day, like inundated with feedback in very direct ways and indirect ways. And so we are very conscious of that. And each of us will make moves individually to try and support the people that we're working with and make sure that the value is there. And obviously, we also have to make decisions for ourselves in terms of facilitators and be realistic about, you know, the ways in which we can bring value without hurting ourselves, either like mentally, emotionally, physically, all those things financially. Um, so it is, it is a game. It is a bit of a game for ourselves too, or, or I don't know if game is the right word, but it is a, a, its own process. Um, but what, one of the worst things that you could possibly do is have this personalized process, um, promise all this value, bring people into something. And then when they get in there, the value of what you brought them into doesn't meet the value that approach them with. And it actually needs to exceed it. And you need to be prepared to do the things that them that you are continuously offering value. So for specific examples, in our program, we have days and times that we meet live to do different things. And we've figured out ways to incorporate certain types of trainings within those days and times, or um, we have, you know, stayed on call for as many hours as it takes. Sometimes that means three and four hours um, of calls with people. And that's just the value that we have to keep up with because that is what we sold. And, you know, we look for ways to have other trainings for them or offer value on the side or, um, you know, connect directly on messenger or text or, or have one-on-ones, whatever the case is, um, to make sure that everyone feels heard and that everyone feels like they're still getting that value. So it, it, there's the piece of it that's like provide the value, have the personalization to bring the people in. But furthermore to that, and to your point about like the reach, the outreach needing to be authentic and really needing to genuinely think that what they said on that workshop was cool. Um, you also need to genuinely be prepared to, um, continue to bring that level of value once you have sold them something and once you have them when you're working with them as well that's really affirming i really appreciate you sharing that because it is true that we on the actually then delivery of the thing people buy we do a really good job of constantly iterating towards how can we serve you better And I think the way that people can do that, because I have been in a number of programs now where they were awesome until you were in it. And then the, like, it starts off really great. And then as they start to get more people, it becomes progressively worse to the point where almost like I have actually been in two programs where the person just left. The person is teaching it just left. And I think for you to, for people who are experienced starting to experience some success, the way to make sure that your program continues improving rather than it becoming this nightmare is you have to get really, really disciplined in your top three priorities of your business. And like even on my weekly to-do list and on my daily to-do list, I have where it has like all my weekly to-dos and then it has priority one, priority two, priority three. And a lot of times what we do is we have like four things under priority one, four things under priority two, four things under priority three, And priority means like one. So even saying three priorities is already two more than you should have. So it's like you have to get really clear on being able to say no to the things that are going to suck away your time and energy from what are those three things that mattered. And you got to get, you got to be willing to be wrong on what those priorities are. I can share one with me for myself was when we started off the retargeting runway I was like, I don't want to get sucked into the Facebook group. 
So I'm going to have someone else manage that. And I'm just going to show up to the live calls really, really great. And like very quickly, we realized that is a really bad strategy. Like the Facebook group, we need you to make that a priority. And so what I found is actually a ton of value that I didn't even realize could have gotten added is being done through the Facebook group. It's something I'm really proud of. And I think it's really resonating with people, but I had to be willing to be wrong and then to like admit it and to hear from our people, this isn't working. And then to reprioritize and be like, if I'm going to make the Facebook group a priority, what's going to get deprioritized? Because it can't be like, this is just important. Well, then I'm going to pretend that I can have a fourth priority now when I barely have time for two. So that's that's kind of my reflection thoughts on people is you got to be an essentialist if we are going to borrow from Greg McEwen on that one. I think that's such a good point. And that's one that I wanted to make a little bit as well is like um, your openness for feedback needs to be there. And it also, you can't, you just need to be calm about it. You can't be sensitive. Um, this is not a personal attack. If someone has feedback about their experience in your thing, whatever that is that you sold them. Um, so we've had some very honest conversations with people in our, in our group over the months and they haven't always been positive. Um, but they're all learning opportunities and they're all very, very, very important. Um, and for us to be able or having, having been able to just kind of like step back, take it in as what it is and then break it down and evaluate it and say, okay, what, what can we do about it? Um, there's been multiple times we've had to do that. And I think one of the things that does happen when people, after they make the sale, after you've built something, you've, you've poured everything into this thing, your, your like blood, sweat, tears, your money, your everything, and you're so attached to it and you're so in love with it. And then somebody comes along and says, I don't, I don't love it. Or this really sucked. And immediately there, that's going to hit you in the gut. And that's going to make you feel like, Oh my God, like the, immediately your reaction is going to be like, well, this person shouldn't be in the program then. Like that is your, your reaction. And that's completely natural, but you have to be willing to let that go and say, Oh my gosh, like, okay, clearly there's a disconnect here on the value that I presented. So what do I need to do from a priority perspective to your point? to hear them, take it into consideration and make the necessary changes in order to, to bring what it is that I promised them to them. So it's difficult, it's not easy, but it's important. I love it. Well, Nikki, this was awesome. I, I think we should do this more regularly. This was really fun. Yeah, I'd love to. And so it's so typical us to like, what are you seeing in marketing? And then we go into a full our conversation about how to run a program. So (laughs) 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 very classic. So I appreciate it. Where can folks get at you if they're a hockey player and they want you to be their agent? Where can folks get at you if they want your advice, if they just want to say how awesome you are, where can they do that? Um, Yeah. So my website is NikkiRoutenberg.com. We can put it in the notes. Uh, And then my Instagram is Nikki Norish, which is my married name. Um, that's those are the best places to find me. So we'll link them and everyone can have access. Awesome. I love it. And so the program that, you know, Nikki and I run together is called the retargeting runway implementation group. And it's really designed from this place where we've been running people's ads together for a while. And we realized that a lot of people think that they're ready to outsource their marketing, but they're not quite there yet. So the program's really designed to get people to a place where they're making 10 K a month with their Facebook ads because then you're in that place now where you can you have that certainty where you can outsource and folks like Nikki and I can really take it to the next level for you. So if you're looking for a group where we get together twice a week on Zoom and review all of your content, your copy, your creative, and we actually look at your ads and review them live on Zoom, if something like that sounds interesting to you, go ahead and hit me up and I can let you know if you're a good fit and send you the information. At Tom Earl Artist, Tom at TomEarl.com. Or you can text me 310-494-2995. All of that will be in the show notes. Nikki, this was awesome. I just want to thank you so yes. much. You're the best. Thank you. And our closing ritual is to share an invitation with those who are listening. So what would you like to invite people to do, to think about, to become, to evolve into? What is your invitation? 
Um, I think I want to invite people to be patient with themselves and approach them, give themselves the this, this space and the grace when it comes to setting up a marketing process for themselves um, from the beginning of planning all the way through the sale, because this isn't easy and it is a lot of trial and error, a ton of testing. And I know everybody says that, but everyone says that because it is a hundred percent true. And so if you are in that process, give yourself the, or in the middle of that process, give yourself the space and the grace to hang on and keep plugging away and figuring out your sweet spot and it will all work out. Well said. I appreciate that. And my invitation to you all is, you've probably heard this before. I'm not the first to say it, the go deep rather than wide. And I've always heard that, especially Gary Vee always says that. And I was, I was like, yeah, 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 that makes sense. That makes sense. But really now what I find is that if you have, let's say, 10 leads, 10 people who have expressed in some way interest that they might be your customers, let's say they don't convert, they don't become customers. Oftentimes we go, okay, I need another 10 leads. But what I want you to do instead is to research each of those 10 people in whatever way you can. Google their name, find them on Instagram, find them wherever you can and go through their stuff and figure out, okay, where can I add value? And then find something specific and let them know, hey, here's something specific I found and insert your value. So for example, what I might do is look and see if somebody right now is in there. If I find them on Instagram, I'll look and see in their Instagram profile, are they offering a freebie? And I'll look at that freebie and I'll look on that website that the freebies on and see if it has a Facebook pixel installed. And I'll look for all these things, right? And let's say there's no Facebook pixel installed. But like, hey, I noticed on your freebie, you don't have a Facebook pixel installed. Here's a link on how to install one. Even if you're not running ads now, you could still have that data when you plan to. Wow, that was really helpful, Tom. I've never had anybody like be that specific. And it makes that person go from you're just one of many to you're somebody that's specific. And so instead of saying, I need five more leads or I need more leads, see how you can with the leads you already have, go deeper and more specific and do something intentional to build that relationship. And that'll probably make the difference much quicker than just adding more people to a process that's not working. Well, Nikki, I appreciate you. Thanks again. You're the best. Thank you. And to all those who are watching, as always, we're wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. Oh, <laughs> oh,